I firmly believe that the veterans are some of the greatest people in our country and we keep getting painted with this negative brush because of mental health issues that honestly most people you know have very little understanding of Welcome to the Change Your POV Podcast. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes of veteran mental health. I'm your host, Dwayne France. Let's get ready to make sure that your headspace and timing is set correctly. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Headspace and Timing. If this is your first time listening, and thanks for checking us out. As many of you who serve know, the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal, is one of the greatest weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing isn't set right, however, it's just a huge chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing's not set correctly either. That's my mission here, to raise awareness about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week we'll talk about different aspects of veteran mental health and interview mental health professionals that are working with veterans, service members, and their families around the country. Hey folks, welcome back to the Headspace and Timing Podcast. I really appreciate you joining us again. I've got uh, an interesting episode today. got a couple of guys coming on uh, who are not mental health professionals, but uh, they they have demonstrated, uh, one, a desire and perhaps uh, a need for veteran mental health uh, intervention. Uh, I have uh, uh, Daniel and Stan... Uh, Dan, Daniel and Stan are, are a couple of guys that put together a documentary called Hammer Down. And uh, we'll definitely get into that, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to, to Stan. Uh, Stan, if you'd introduce yourself and, and kind of tell us a little about, bit about who you are and what you got going on. Sure. Uh, my name is Stan Lake. Uh, I'm from North Carolina. And uh, personally, I joined the uh, Army National Guard for the whole one weekend a month, two weeks in the summer, get to blow stuff up. It's going to be great. And then six days later, 9-11 happened. And uh, I learned real quick that choosing a combat job was a, was a pretty, I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but it, it landed me in Iraq a few years later in 2005, which is where my buddy Daniel here and I kind of began to, you know, develop a pretty strong friendship. And uh, I guess through that process, uh, you know, we, made films while we were over there and different things like that that I'm sure we're going to talk about. But in a nutshell, that's that's kind of my military career. Just I, I was a 13 mic, which is multiple launch rocket systems. And uh, when we went to Iraq, I was a 50 cal gunner on a Humvee. And then we were put together after they disbanded our gun truck platoon and put us in up-armored 915 tractor trailers. So it was kind of a culture shock to culture shock to culture shock. And then we just kept bouncing around. But uh, I'll let you kind of tell them about your stuff, Daniel. Well, I'm uh, Daniel Charles. Uh, I joined in 99 when I was 17, young, dumb, and idealistic. And uh, I was Stan's direct supervisor, so I got stuck with Stan in Iraq, and I'm still stuck with Stan now, and I don't know how this has all happened. <laughs> Just, Same deployment. <laughs> I, have, I have no official responsibilities whatsoever, and I make no claims of... So, so, any, uh, so you take credit for Stan's... Uh, greatness but uh, but everything that uh, that he does wrong is on him no it actually the, the opposite it was typical what happened i usually just got blamed for everything i think i think they put stan with me uh because they knew i was pretty responsible and um but I, we still had fun so we still had fun but within reason and uh and i don't think they liked me and i think that's another reason they put stan with me because if he got in trouble, then they could get me in trouble. Oh yeah, yeah I was in. Yeah, then you wouldn't be. You wouldn't have gotten in trouble on your own. But guilt by association, I can. Uh, I can oh, tell. Yeah. You got passed around quite a bit. <laughs> I was in three different. <laughs> yeah, three different platoons uh, while we were deployed in that year that we were deployed. You know, I started in second with those guys, boots on the ground. We got there. They moved me to a gun truck platoon, and then a few months later, like five months later, they disbanded the gun trucks, and I ended up in first platoon. So went second fourth and first <laughs> the only reason i couldn't go to third was because my brother was serving in there actively at the time <laughs> so 
You know, that's, uh, that's something interesting, guys. You know, when I was uh, deployed to Afghanistan uh, in, uh, in 2009-2010, um, the engineers that served with us were a uh, guard unit out of Indiana. And, uh, and there were a lot of siblings, right? There were a lot of, uh, a lot of family members, right? You know, everybody joined from the same place. And, and the two guys, uh, they were actually uh, cousins, you know, so their, their parents were um, uh, brother and sister. Uh, is that typical in your unit? Had a lot of people that were related to each other? Yeah, I think in the national, I mean, National Guard, I'm sure it happens because it's a community-based organization in a lot of senses that gets mobilized and goes to war. But in ours specifically, it was myself and my brother. There were two brothers in the maintenance platoon. And I think there was, oh, oh yeah, yeah, there were two more uh, platoon sergeants that were brothers also. So I know of at least three sets of brothers that were deployed over there. And naturally, they wouldn't let us, you know, be in the same like if we were out on the road or on convoys, we couldn't do convoy security for my brother's platoon and I couldn't be in the same barracks and stuff like that. So they tried to keep us apart, I guess, for just logistical reasons so that if something happened to one of us, they wouldn't get us both. Um, but yeah, it's pretty common, I think, in the guard. I mean, it's again, it's a, it's a whole community effort. So just by nature, you end up kind of taking families too. And I think the other interesting thing from, from both of your stories, and I, I know, Stan, you you don't have much pre nine eleven experience at all, but but Dan, you were in the guard for you know a, a couple of years before it happened. Uh, most of my career spanned. Uh, I joined in ninety two, and so uh, half of my career really uh, occurred before nine eleven. Um, what was that like for you, uh, maybe Daniel specifically, before nine eleven to afterwards? What did you see change? I, th- I think you know be- before it was still. Um kind of the good old boys were just playing games. And then whenever, uh, you know, as, you know, everybody remembers where they were when the tower, when the second tower fell at least. And um, I was glued to the radio, you know, working construction at the time. And I was just waiting for that call uh, from then on out. And uh, our unit really, it stopped being a, a weekend club for, for the boys to hang out in. And it became more of a, we really got focused because we were, when we were coming from all walks of life. You, know, you had uh, you had people that had been in the military for a long time. You had people that were police officers who were in the medical field, who were in construction and teachers. You name it. And we nine eleven got everybody real serious about the actual job, the actual mission. We started training for uh, QRF and things like that, uh, riot control, um, dealing with civilians uh, as far as um, citizen civilians and non-citizen civilians, that sort of thing. And uh, it just got real serious after that. We were just basically waiting for our turn to go serve. And some of us were looking forward to it. Some of us were apprehensive. But I think everybody, you know, knew what was going to happen. We're just waiting to hear the win. Yeah, I think that was a, a big thing that I saw, too, was uh, there were there were some, uh, you know, senior leader, but there were some people that didn't make that shift between the peacetime army uh, or, or the peacetime service uh, to to really uh, post nine eleven service and and maybe that was for the best. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Yeah. We, I agree. <laughs> we were both at college at the time. Actually, like we had to finish up our last semester just so we could deploy. Uh, I mean, luckily it ended. Like we deployed or mobilized rather in May, so our professors let us take our exams and stuff early, and then you know from May until. August of the next year, we were on active duty. So almost 18 months, we were on active duty, and uh, and it was kind of a wild ride. So uh, you guys, uh, when were you in Iraq? 2005 to 2006. So 05 to 06. I mean, it was uh, and and it was right there at that point of maybe the the changing of uh, rules of engagement it, it sort of stopped being the wild west from the the early days what a lot of guys were talking about uh and then a lot more roe i was uh october of 06 to uh december of 07 i was there so i caught a lot of that shift yeah. uh as well uh but uh but in the film and, and we'll talk about the film here but you guys you didn't have mlrs's in uh in iraq you guys didn't uh you, you guys got picked up and and said here you go yeah, we went from being like high performers on MLRS. Like I know personally, like I was always on a, a Top Gun, you know, gun truck and stuff like that. And Daniel was always in the top of the ammo platoons doing that stuff. 
to a literal crash course in convoy operations. And our training was so weird because we trained for every scenario. I mean, we weren't told actually that we were going to be doing convoys with trucks until probably about a month before we actually deployed. So for two months prior, a little bit more than that, we were doing training, uh, MP training. We were doing infantry training, kicking in door type stuff, and and all kinds of just different types of training. So none of us really knew the mission um, until we were about to leave. They shipped us to Alabama for a literal crash course in driving trucks and uh, down at Fort McClellan. And we had, I think it was two weeks to learn how to drive tractor trailers and do Humvee gun truck operations and stuff like that. And then all of us didn't even get all the training because I know personally I didn't get picked up for the gun trucks until we got in country and I hadn't received, you know, I just received like the, the block training, but I didn't receive the actual platoon specific stuff. So it was really interesting kind of how it all came together. But once we were in country, we all got real serious again. And, you know, we trained, I think, for maybe a month, like maybe two weeks to a month in country, the Udari range in Kuwait and a few other places and kind of got acclimated. Um, and then it got real serious. Then we just pretty much stayed nonstop on the road our entire deployment. Yeah, I think, you know, coming from a guard background and, um, you know, being deployed like that, we we had something to prove. So as soon as we figured out what our actual mission was, we all got real serious about it. But it was kind of a little frustrating not figuring out the mission that far along. But uh, what we did down in McClellan, a little bit of, uh, like, like you said, the crash course that we did have, that was extraordinarily helpful comparatively to all the other stuff because that's what we ended up using. You know, it's just actually doing what we were going to be doing over there so uh, that was pretty helpful um i kind of got picked up on gun trucks but it was an outside unit when we first got there as well and uh, i hadn't done any of that i just wanted to do it because it was a lot cooler <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't that you know i don't i don't think i told stan this or, or how much but uh, but that was actually you know this is some backstory i joined the reserves uh, back in 92 and so i was in the reserves for about nine months before I realized that uh, that one week in a month and two weeks out of the year was the best year or best part of that year. Uh, but I was in logistics. I was a truck driver. I was a transporter. That's so awesome. uh, two weeks is about what you need. I mean, it's not real. It's it's not rocket science. I mean, it's left foot, right foot, steering wheels in the middle. But uh, you do need a, a little bit more skill to do it right. Uh, but later on in my career, uh, we were doing security escort and, uh, and, and gun truck stuff. And, and you're right, Daniel, that was a lot cooler than, uh, than the line haul. It think, was it was a blast. Wink. <laughs> I think if we had a good solid two years, I could teach Stan to drive well. Yeah, I think it's a drive often. I, uh, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I was a will hog. Yeah, Daniel loved to drive. And so it was like when I was in the gun truck, I loved to gun. My buddy Patterson loved to drive. It was a great relationship. When I got transferred out of that into a, a uh, bobtail tractor trailer, Daniel loved to drive, and I loved to just sit there with my saw and look out the window. <laughs> I actually just loved to live, and I knew how bad he was at driving. <laughs> I was going to say, there's <laughs> probably some ulterior mode. You're finding all kind of new things out here, Stan. Yeah. So you guys, uh, you're, you're talking about, and, and it was, and it was serious. It was a serious time, especially right before uh, 05, 06 when the surge started to come in but you keep using that word serious right and 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 somehow i don't think that it was fully serious seeing some of the uh shenanigans uh that seemed to go on downrange so uh talk a little bit about your little uh uh, uh handheld camera documentary when you were downrange yeah so we were strong like proponents and fans of jackass and the wild boys and stuff like that and so it just only became natural that we wanted to be the combat component of Jackass and started filming all kinds of uh, shenanigans, pranks on each other. You know, our, our poor buddy Butler, we would wake him up in all the most obscure ways, uh, you know, throw things at his face or whatever and film it. I woke him up with boxing gloves one time. Uh, did not did not go over well. Um, you know, <laughs> one of my favorite things to do over there, like again with the Jackass stuff, like I loved Party Boy and, and his thing during Jackass was to wear thongs. So I thought it would be great to get alterations, the AFES alterations people to, you know, when we had downtime to make me outfits. So <laughs> they made me a pair of thongs that got me in a lot of trouble. Um, they made me a pink luchador wrestling outfit that I wear. I wore 
um, on a convoy line in the middle of Iraq, just running up and down as we were prepping to go out the wire. <laughs> and uh, we just did that stuff. I mean, we traced it back. We started even filming. Uh, a lot of my background is, is in wildlife and biology and things. That's what I was in school for. And so I was filming things like that. And so it started out kind of a mix between jackass and us filming wildlife. We started in Alabama when we were at Fort McClellan. We put out a DVD called Fort McClellan Gone Wild. And um, it was a mix between the two things and kind of passed it around, just burned it on our laptops and passed it around to the guys in the unit. And they loved it. Like, you know, everybody seemed to love it, but it was still skating that uh, that line of it really wasn't OK for us to be doing that with our leadership, but it wasn't hurting anything yet. Um, and it did progress to that for some other people in our unit. We can talk about that later. But <laughs> but uh, with, with us specifically, like we kind of started this whole thing. And, uh, and just kept doing it. And it, it became a stress reliever. It became, you know, when it's when it's game time, we're focused. When we have downtime, we are going buck wild and doing dumb stuff. Uh, it's basically like we had a secondary unspoken mission of morale. Yeah. Because morale is, you know, morale is very low because you have, I mean, all these, I mean, I, I say kids. I guess I was a kid too, but you have 18-year-old, 19-year-old kids fresh out of basic now you're in war you know and you're you're getting shot at every day there's mortars there's ids every every mission brief you know we're hearing about everybody that's gotten hit that night and so you know there's this sense of doom and gloom but also you know you just needed to unwind and become human again and that's kind of where i think that's why the brass didn't mind they weren't gonna. They were gonna come out and say, "Go ahead and do it. You have our blessing." Right. But at the same time, they were not gonna stop it because they enjoyed it themselves. They saw people laughing in the barracks instead of, you know, just being alone by themselves. They saw it, you know, as a uh, a positive virus that kind of that we spread out. Until <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, and we, then one time, yeah, we so. had a buddy well, like. Uh, we had a couple of buddies that took it too far. Like one guy was on an escort mission to Kuwait and decided it would be funny to pull his pants down uh, in the middle of Kuwait city and dance up on a parked civilian vehicle with a female in it. And uh, obviously that culture that's very offensive, a man got out, wrapped his belt around his fist and proceeded to almost beat our buddy. And then he drew down on him, which is also a no-no in Kuwait. So he ended up getting deported from the country of Kuwait, and they shipped him to another unit up in the middle of Iraq. And we did—we have actually never seen him again. <laughs> like, <laughs> like a, that's a true story. That's, uh, I mean, that's, uh, we yeah. never heard from the guy again. That's, uh, yeah, but I, I, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely some uh, some taking things uh, a little bit too far. You know, I'm I'm sitting here, I'm I'm listening, you guys. Stan, you're. You're the guy that just wants to have uh, have have a lot of fun and, and and a good time. And Daniel, you're the one that gives him the reason behind him being allowed to do the jackassery. Basically, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I was I was his safety net. So if he got in too much trouble, just well, Sergeant Charles let me do it. You know, <laughs> he was also my conscience because I don't have much of a filter or much of like a hey, let's don't do that. He would have to remind me, hey, like we're in a combat zone. You probably need your weapon and stuff like that. So we always couldn't do everything that I wanted to do, which is a good thing. Yeah, I, uh, as, as I was uh, getting ready and I, I said I was going to save it for the podcast here, I uh, uh, so I was a uh, senior NCO by the time I deployed. I was an E7 already. Uh, so I wasn't much up on the jackassery, right? You know, I was probably one of those higher level guys. And, and even as a platoon sergeant in Afghanistan uh, where we had a security escort mission, uh, and, and I think I had told Stan this is I probably would have been the one locking you guys up. I probably would have been the one saying, you know, what do you yahoos think you're doing? Uh, was there some of that? Oh, yeah. Like my upper body was strong. Like, <laughs> like I did more push ups in that year probably than I did the rest of my life. Um, luckily, like like we said, like we never got in real trouble, but we did get stern talking to I actually almost got an article 15. Apparently I learned after the fact because of a, the thong incident that I did, um, I got locked up and had to do push-ups and, like, assless chaps and thongs. Um, Mostly on film. Yeah, I was on film. And that's I was going to say, I think I saw a couple of those in the uh, – Yeah. 
we tried to like the part of this documentary, like we weren't able to put as much into it that we wanted to. Cause part of the deal was we actually did get a small grant from the North Carolina humanities council for uh, social studies classes in North Carolina to make the film. So there was a round of edits where we had to edit out some of the stuff that was a little bit too uh, racy, I guess for you know high school students, which is most of the stuff that we really enjoyed. Uh, and we, we may end up eventually releasing like a director's cut. I was going to say a hammered down redux or something. Yeah. Maybe that's it. A... We actually never even explain in the film what hammered down even is. I mean, it's, it's obvious to some, but I mean, that was our, uh, it's our unit motto because of the nature of what we did. Just if, if we receive contact, put the hammer down on the gas pedal and get out of contact basically was the reason. And that's that was why we, yeah, that was our ROE at the time. So just lame. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you talk about the film. I mean, it, so you you had uh, in 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 the movie you talk about this stand, but um, you know what? Ca- you know, I got I don't know pictures and videos. I mean, they're just uh, sitting somewhere dusty in in a closet or up in the attic or something where my wife won't let me have my army stuff out, right? You know what? What got the the videos, the the funny stuff, uh, off your hard drive and, and into the movie? I think I just finally got motivated. I, you know, I tried making this film. I mean, no less than three other times in ten years. Um, you know, since we got home at the time, and uh, you know, one thing or another would happen: a hard drive would crash, or I would lose footage. Um, you know. X, Y, or Z, it just, I guess the stars aligned and just made sense finally. And I just, I poured everything into it. I mean, it was, I was a zombie working on this film. I mean, I had, I thought I had a lot of footage and then come time to do the film. I didn't have near enough. Uh, you know, I think I had 20 tapes, give or take a uh, little mini DV cassette tapes. Cause that's what we used to film everything on. And, um, you know, I think we, we just kind of started connecting with our old unit again through a Facebook group that we have for that deployment. And uh, I think maybe some guys posted some pictures, and I remembered that I had, over the years, kind of posted little 30-second snippets of stuff that I had. And I just put it out there. I said, hey, like I, I put together like a minute and a half little teaser, and I said, hey, would anybody be interested, you know, if I did something like this, if I made this film? And uh, a buddy of ours reached out to me. He's a school teacher. He served with us. And uh, he said, hey, we're actually applying for a grant right now. If you really want to do this, let's all kind of come at it from this angle. And uh, I guess we just started thinking about it, and it, it started to make sense. We were able through the grant to contract a buddy of ours to kind of come in and help us film so we don't have to do everything. Um, I ended up editing it still and doing a bulk of the work for it, but it was still great to have help um, from our buddy Derek. And I don't know, it just – it kind of just happened. I mean, it's like I said, I've been sitting on it forever and I do, we make videos all the time. Daniel and I have been, we have ne- we haven't stopped making videos since we've been home. We just shifted gears and did an animal show uh, called catching creation. We've been doing that for probably six or eight years. Yeah. And before that it was called something else. We just kept going out, filming fun stuff, filming animals and, and, you know, just kind of hanging out. And that, that was our therapy and that's what we've been doing. And still to this day, I mean, we're, we may do it after we get off here with you. So <laughs> I think part of the catalyst, too, for it getting made was we, we just had our 10-year reunion coming up. It would have been 10 years, and we decided to have a reunion. But that, that whole fact that, hey, we got, we're, we're almost back for 10 years now. Let's, let's finally do this, you know. And uh, so we just had to figure out, out of everything we have and all the access to the people we still have, what, what is the story? You know, so once we had that nailed down, you know, it was a lot of plug and play and a lot of, uh, you know, just finding what what backed up the story the best, what uh, pushed the story forward the best as far as our ar- archival footage and things of that sort and our interviews. So so talk about that a little bit. I mean, what what really uh, I, I see the movie um, is, is really two different things. You guys are going back and forth, but you're talking about some really important stuff. It's about coming home from combat. It's about reconnecting with the old friends. So, so what is the arc of the story? What what is the the drive behind the movie? I mean, I think it's more about it's just about coming home and being lost and realizing you're not alone. I mean, I think that's the biggest takeaway is realizing that 
you may feel alone. You may feel like no one else understands you, but at the very least at a base level, the guys you served with understand you. Those guys are still your family. Um, and it was us reminding ourselves that we had these people and us reminding ourselves that, Hey, you know, just because we feel lost or broken sometimes doesn't mean that we are broken or doesn't mean that, um, we're the only ones feeling this way. And I think once we started seeing these other guys were having the same experience, it was liberating. It was like, okay, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not this wimpy guy or I'm not dealing with this the wrong way, or maybe I am, but there's other guys experiencing it in the same capacity. Um, and so it gave us a mission to help serve those guys. Hey, let's tell their stories. So maybe it helped us tell our story. Maybe if these guys tell theirs, it'll help kind of get it off their chest and reintegrate them into a community again. Um, so that we can kind of lean on each other. I mean, out of this film, I mean, it really did. It was the catalyst for us helping put together a 10 year reunion for our, for our unit for that deployment. You know, it's helped us put together probably about eight camping trips since then, uh, where we just gather a veterans only camping trip, um, in a national forest near us. And, um, it gets weird. Yeah, it gets weird, but <laughs> but uh, I would say from the archival footage from Iraq, I would imagine that it uh, some of that carries over. But but it needs to, you know. I mean, I think well, yeah. we need to remember that we're not like we don't have to be so serious all the time. We don't have to be so you know dress right dress. Like it's okay to cut loose once in a while and let that stuff out, you we, know, good or bad. We basically like picked up that same mission that he and I, you know, had over there again. Is like. Let's just let's start up with a morale. You know, all these guys have been out. They're now they're disenchanted. They're feeling alone. They're not connected anymore. Um, their best days are behind them. They think you know, and so you know, picking this back up and getting the guys together and getting out in the woods and just living, you know, living in a, in a community, bringing that aspect of it back together, where there's value and you have self worth again and and things of that nature. And you you just realize that you are not the only one that has some issues. And that's nice, you know, it's nice to see people that you respected overseas, people um, who are hardcore, and, you know, they're having some of the same problems you are. It makes, you know, it's it's just there's some comfort in knowing that you are not alone in your suffering and that there are people who actually do care about you that are still out there, they're still around. That's the beauty of the, the Guard is a lot of us, are we're still relatively close. I mean, we've spread out to, you know, the whole probably eastern seaboard now, but there's still enough guys in our area, enough guys in our state that we can, within reason, get together, you know, and, and share some of life together. It's not just uh, just one person on their own anymore. And I think that's a, that's a good point you made there, Daniel, was the, the, the decade, um, you know, creeps up on you. I, it was... Yeah. Uh, uh, October of 16 before I realized that, that it had been, you know, 10 years and, and, uh, you know, not in, in, for me, there were a couple more deployments in there and, and military retirement and stuff like that. But, but it sounds like there was a, a wide gap for each of you individually. You guys stayed connected, uh, but you drifted away from everybody else. What was that 10 years like between the deployment and, and finally getting it back together? Honestly, as soon as you see, as soon as you see those brothers again, it, picks up exactly where it left off yes. and you're like wow you're just a little bit uglier than i knew you 10 years ago but you're exactly the same we still have that exact same bond i think whenever you deploy together and you get shot at together and you you know you are in that kind of situation where it's it, it really is a life or death and you just get used to it that's your new normal when you get used to that with us with a certain group of people i don't think that goes away and uh that's kind of the this treasure we've had, but we haven't been accessing, you know, this, this, this huge, um, just thing we should have been doing all these years is just being near each other, you know, helping each other out and that sort of thing. And it, just to rediscover that and that bond that we thought was gone, or we thought that was, you know, those twilight, you know, those, those golden years are gone to see that that's still around. We still have that exact same bond, those same feelings, you know, that same goofiness, that same camaraderie. That's a good, that's, you know, that's healthy, you know, and, and you can really move on from there uh, and, and, you know, see where you're at now. And it's not, you know, you're not just a kid anymore. You know, we all get, you know, families and things now, and it just, now we can do this part of life together. Whereas there we did that part of life together. 
No, I, I really like that idea. I mean, the, the idea is um, everybody has this um, the vision of, of what veteran mental health is. It's all PTSD and TBI. Um, and that's really what I want to get through with this podcast, that there are more challenges as well as more benefits uh, to military service. And, and what you're talking about is really, you know, existential psychology. I mean, it's, we're in my realm of of purpose and meaning and, 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 you know, how do I make meaning of suffering and how do I make meaning of what happened? Um, but I hear this, this part of my best years are behind me and how do I, you know, you know, I'm no longer, you know, Sergeant France anymore. Who am I? Who is my purpose? Who is my identity? Um, you know, that, that's not the realm of philosophers. That's, uh, that, that goes to veterans now too. Is that something that you struggle with, Stan? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, just learning who I am, you know, over the years you've developed identities in certain capacities and, and you stop doing it, you know, a certain thing, you come home from war or whatever. Now I'm no longer a soldier. I'm, you know, I'm laying in bed drinking myself to sleep because I don't care. I've got no focus or mission anymore, you know, and it's, um, you know, that's what it was for a little while. And thankfully finding and having friends that were, you know, close by kind of helped me not stay in that you know, any longer than I had to. Um, and I think that's even with what we're doing, it's like, I want to change the narrative. I, I don't want to focus on the fact that veterans all have PTSD or veterans are all broken or all whatever this, you know, culture wants to paint us in a corner with it's, Hey, we've been through tough stuff, but we're tough people, you know, and we can persevere. And the fact is, is the only people that really understand us are us. So let's, you know, make it happen and move forward, but find a mission, find a purpose and find a body to do it with. And I think that's kind of what our collective mission has been, has been just to, to drive forward and help other people see that, Hey, you're not alone. And that, um, I don't know. Like I, I just, I firmly believe that the veterans are some of the greatest people in our country. And we keep getting painted with this negative brush because of mental health issues that honestly, most people, you know, have very little understanding of. Um, and even personally, like I'm just, I'm beginning to understand it in my own life. Like having spent 10 years bur burying emotions or 12 years almost burying stuff and just now finally swallowing my pride and going and talking to a PTSD counselor or, you know, just seeking help because I know that if I'm not willing to do it myself, I have no business advocating others to do it. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's been, one of the big things that we got out of the film is we've learned a lot of guys through the film and through just re re interacting with one another. A lot of us have gone, you know, I could count on at least five guys that have gone and gotten help with, you know, whether it's the VA or private uh, counselors or whatever, but of seeking help not to sit in, in the suck, but to move forward and say, Hey, like I can overcome this. I can get tools to work past this stuff because I'm not going to be another statistic or I'm not going to be um, just another broken vet that you see on the news or whatever. Yeah, you know, I and, and this is something that I've written and, and really focus uh, both again on the podcast and the blog is the guns don't go silent when the war is over. Uh, they're still echoing in our head, uh, but veterans don't need to go silent either. And, and that's, I, I think, one of the biggest challenges many of them do. And I say many of us do. Um, but but we, we try to integrate and pretend, like you said, Daniel, either it was the best years of our lives or it was totally non-existent or I put a pause and, and I tried to avoid it. But what you guys are doing with the, the Hammer Down film is you're not being silent. You're, you're putting it out there and you're saying, hey, it's OK um, to, to show the other side of what deployments could have been or, or were. Um, you know, some people want to tell all the horror stories, but. I, I could tell you some funny stories about, you know, donkeys running out of the patrols. And there's a story about a monkey that I have to make sure that, you know, I don't, my kids aren't around, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's the, the funny things that happen too, but you guys, you're taking the movie and you're not being silent. Uh, and it's great to hear that you use that not only for your own benefit, to, but to help other veterans um, come to the point of saying, you know, it's okay for me to talk about this. And I don't think it's abnormal. I mean, I've like from the books I've read, you know, you see guys during the Civil War doing the same shenanigans and doing things like that. You see guys in World War II doing the same stuff. Um, it's barracks so, humor. Yeah, it's yeah. barracks humor. I mean, it's gallows humor, whatever you call it. I mean, we've all probably obviously got a more 
darkened sense of humor than the average person because of it. But I think in a lot of ways, humor and comedy helps us to cope. And if, you know, if I can laugh about it, I'm not dwelling in the sadness of it or the, or the whatever, like it just helps me, uh, put a positive perspective on stuff. If I can at all possible, you know, I want to think in that regard about it. I mean, because Iraq, yeah, for, for all its ills and all the bad stuff that went on in Iraq for us, I mean, I would go back in a heartbeat. Like that is one of the most beautiful countries I've ever visited. It was the greatest adventure of my life. It's not the last adventure of my life, but it was a great experience in a lot of ways. If I choose to remember it in that regard, you know, were there bad times? Sure. But thankfully, you know, it, the, the good is, it does outweigh it in some degree. So I agree. You, would you go back, Daniel? Would you, uh, would you go back? Do you, do you feel the love of Iraq that Stan does? I go back every night. <laughs> every night. My sweet, sweet dreams. Yeah, true. I do. I do go back all the time. You know, but uh, it's it's kind of like he said. It's it's that adventure that you you're still craving for. You're still longing for. You had it there, and it was cool. You know, you had experiences there. You felt alive, maybe for the first time in your life in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever. Um, but you know, it, you come to grips with who you are as a person. So. There, you know, it's just like your first time or what, you know, your first car, you know, anything like that. It's just that experience, you know, you can't, you can't go back fully to that experience, even if you went back to that place. Right. But at the same time, you can enjoy the nostalgia of it. You can look back on it with rose colored glasses, but you know, you also need to look at it, you know, a little bit realistically too. But, uh, I loved it. I had a great time in Iraq. I mean, I can't even count the amount of times we almost died. Yeah. <laughs> but it just, you know, after, you know, the third or fourth time, it just, it didn't, like, you just laughed it off. Right. You know? And that was literally what you, what you just did there. Right. You know, I mean, how many times, yeah, we almost died, but we, but we say it with a laugh and, and people that don't have that frame of reference be like, what are the, you know, you guys are crazy. You're, you're laughing about, about death. Um, in, I'll have to take your word for it uh, because I spent 15 months in, in Baghdad, so I can't say that I felt the beauty of Iraq. Um, I would, though. I, I do see myself going back to Afghanistan like the old Vietnam dudes, and, and I feel the same way about my uh, my Afghanistan deployment as, as you guys do about your Iraq deployment. Um, but, but there is a love-hate relationship. It's the best of times, worst of times. Um, and, and often within, you know, seconds of each other or minutes of each other, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, so now that uh, now that you have sort of come back and, and you've got the film, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit. You said you've done some of the the uh, camping trips and you had your reunion. Um, what has been some of the reaction from your buddies that were deployed? Uh, you saw some of the 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 superiors that you had in the film, what's their reaction been to the movie? I was going to say that to, as far as to the, the camping trips and just the reconnecting, it's been a overall, everybody has kind of just been like, why have we not done that? Why did it take 10 years to do this? Um, I'll let Stan speak a little bit more to the film, but it, you know, as a catalyst to just purposefully start hanging out. So we were going to do the camping trip one time a year. Oh, well, you can't make it. You can't make it. You can't make it. Well, the fact that you're all brothers and you're all tight, you want everybody there. Well, we'll just have more camping trips. So, it, you know, we just we kind of we've adjusted, you know, how how we organize things to try to include as many people as we can to try to get everybody there because we love them. You know, we love them. We want them to be there. And uh, as far as the movie, I'll let you speak to that. Yeah, I mean, just it's been a good experience, a good uh, a lot of people, you know, and it's random people have kind of reached out and just thanked us for making the film. Um, I mean, I've had people in the most bizarre places. Like I posted it on LinkedIn one day and, and someone reached out and says, I've never seen a film that showed what we did in Iraq. You know, nobody showed that side of it where the convoy side or, or the humor side or whether, whatever it may be. And it kind of blew me away. Cause I, you know, I had no context of knowing who this person was and then I've had people's parents, you know, one of the guys we served with that we haven't talked to since we've been home just for whatever reason. Um, you know, his mom reached out and bought two DVDs. And so when sometimes when people purchase things and I'm not familiar with who they are, I, just, I email them back, hey, who's this? How'd you hear about us? 
and she's like, oh, I'm so-and-so's mother. You know, I'm just really thankful for what you did. Um, and just the filming of itself. I mean, we had a premiere. We had a lot of guys get together for that. You know, a lot of people that may have not spoken to each other, uh, that had ill feelings towards one another or whatever the reason may be, you know, got together, broke bread, and were able to, to communicate with one another. And I think that that's been a huge thing for us. You know, there's some scenes in the movie where we went to Washington, D.C., and interviewed one of our great friends, James Pierce, who's now a national park. Uh, he works for the National Park System in Washington, D.C., and he's got an amazing story. And so it was good seeing him, you know, knowing him from our deployment, knowing what happened to him on his next one, and seeing where he is today, you know, as a park ranger in D.C., and him showing us around, and just kind of the, not nostalgia, but the, um, uh, I guess how somber in some spots it is in D.C., where it's just like overwhelming yeah the sacrifice that guys in our country, men and women in our country have made on our behalf, um, that it, it just, I don't know. It was like, we couldn't have not made this film. And I, I hope to, you know, that we get to make more of them in the future, uh, and, and tell other people's stories because our unit is just one microcosm in this huge, you know, big picture, uh, that there are tons of guys that need their stories told, you know, men and women that just need to tell, you know, their story, both good and bad, you know, even if it's just to get it off their chest. And, you know, that's one of the projects we've kind of got way on the back burner is, is kind of filming these other, other stories from other generations and other branches of service and whatnot that we haven't really, we've kind of tickled it a little bit. We haven't really pursued it as much as we ought to, but it's, it's coming. (laughs) You know, there's a couple things I I, I hear from that is, uh, is healing A, a lot of healing. Uh, yeah, you guys healing personally, not that, not that, uh, you know, not broken, not, not, you know, garbage, or but just, but, uh, you know, things get bruised, things get, uh, messed up. And, and, uh, it sounds like there was a lot of solace for you in healing and making this movie and in turn has helped healed others. Would that be uh, accurate? I'll agree and disagree. Like I'll, I'll agree that there's been healing that's taken place for sure, but in that healing process, there has been a lot of old wounds that have been ripped open yeah. um, and kind of salt thrown in them, you know, so that they can heal because maybe we never let them heal appropriately the first time. Uh, so there's been a lot of that where it's been, I mean, I know for sure during the process of making the film, it was literally like a raw nerve. Uh, I mean, our stress and anxiety and just all of that during the process of the film was on high alert. But then there were those moments of clarity when we were actually filming the guys or, in the heat of the interview where it just made sense. Um, but there was a lot of, a lot of anxiety and stress just involved in making it just because we're having to confront things that we've done a really good job of hiding from for years. Um, and through that, I mean, even now it's like with us going and speaking with, uh, counselors at the vet center, um, it's helping for sure. Or they say it's helping, but this (laughs) phase of the process for me is just brutal um, because I guess you just forget about all the things, uh, that you tried to forget. <laughs> so yes, it's been good and bad. Definitely a positive for sure, but it's a positive that's been, uh, a process. There's been a lot of healing, but he's still waiting for all those bumps to go away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, and this is something that I'm not sure either one of you or, or both could answer. You have uh, family members, uh, maybe Gulf War vets or Vietnam vets. Did either of you have uh, sort of family history in military service? My uh, my real father was in Vietnam. He was a POW. He was a recon pilot. Um, but I didn't have a real close relationship to him he got killed when i was uh four so i didn't really know him know him yeah but i'd always wanted to be in the military because of him right um so i just i've always had this kind of awe and you know respect for soldiers and whenever i had a I actually the first person who called my house asking if i join anything i said yep and uh somehow talked my mom into it because i was seven i was 16 when he called or maybe 17 but uh it worked out <laughs> yeah my, uh, I have an uncle, my mom's brother was in the 82nd mm-hmm. Airborne and uh, just retired a few years ago as a lieutenant colonel from there. And so he influenced me in a big way, kind of indirectly. I just saw his life, you know, and and what military service looked like for him and, you know, how distinguished it was and how uh, I really looked up to him growing up. And so I remember, like, as a kid being, you know, that kid in elementary school that's wearing BDUs to school during the Gulf War and stuff like that. Oh, you were that guy. 
Yeah, I was that guy. You know, uh, I was just really into it. Really, always been into history. Um, just kind of a nerd, and always read read books and things like that. And uh, so yeah, and like other than that, it's just me and my brother. My brother enlisted uh, probably two weeks after I did. He's a year younger than I am, and uh, so his birthday falls on the tenth of September. September eleventh happened, and then so he enlisted. I think like that next week, and I enlisted the week before. So we went to basic about six months apart. And, uh, and then ended up getting to serve together. And that's one of the things I'm really proud of. I mean, I'm super blessed that my brother, not only did we get to serve together, but that we both came back. Um, Cause that was a huge, you know, for me personally, my little brother over there, it's a stress for me thinking that something could happen to him. Um, and stuff did happen on their convoys that was, you know, kind of freaky for a while until we found that everybody was okay. And, um, you know, but that's that's really our only family legacy that I have is just an uncle that was in the military. Well, I just in in some of the reason for that is to demonstrate it is a, a family affair uh, for many, uh, and especially both the both of you. Um, but just uh, seeing how long it took um, Vietnam veterans really uh, to come to terms and do what you guys are doing now, um, it, it took them a, a lot longer than ten years, probably fifteen to twenty. Some of them probably about 30 to 40 years. Uh, my father also served in Vietnam. And, and Stan, like you, uh, my younger half-brother, uh, he and I were deployed in Afghanistan at the same time. We were in separate units. And so uh, definitely knowing um, the, the, uh, the impact of that. Um, but but to, to bring that back is, is you guys are, you learn the lesson a lot sooner. Um, we learned the lesson a lot sooner, our generation, than the Vietnam veterans did. We didn't wait decades uh, to finally make this connection. Uh, and I think you guys are doing a good job by using the technology to help other veterans know that it's possible and, and really even necessary. I think a lot of the Vietnam veterans, they just came back to a different atmosphere than we did. So I, I don't know if they, they didn't discover it, but they just suffered in silence for years and years and years until it wasn't a bad thing to be a, a Vietnam vet anymore. I mean, I remember even growing up in the 90s, there was kind of this, that was one of the stereotypes that you'd see on uh, comedy shows or, or in movies is the disgruntled Vietnam vet, and that's how they were pictured. But, you know, with our gener well, your generation, with our generation, whenever you came back from war, whether you liked the war or not and whether you agreed with it or not, when you came back as a hero to, the, to this country. But, you know, they came back and got spit on. They, you know, I, I, I uh, used to work with a guy who sur who was in Vietnam, and he's he was a tunnel rat, really small guy, and he said he was down in a tunnel one time, and he opened up a, he, you know, he was clearing the tunnel, and he finds he finds a care package, par excuse me, care package from uh, uh, Berkeley. Berkeley College, you know, out in California, sending sending like a care package to the enemy. You know, like literally because like, – and so that's the atmosphere they came back to. So I don't think it's that it took them longer necessarily to realize that they needed help. I think that it was it was just a survival method for them is just to stay silent, suffer in silence. And eventually, you know, our country got its head out of its butt about the Vietnam War and about our, our veterans from that war, that forgotten, you know, veteran group. And started giving them a little bit of the respect they very much deserve. I mean, most of those guys were drafted. They didn't. Even, they didn't want to go. You know, they didn't choose to go. They just the country said go, and they went. And that's that's amazing. I mean, I signed up because I thought it'd be cool to be in the army and blow stuff up. You know, I had always wanted to be in, but I can only imagine if I you know if I was just some kid in college and never thought of never shot a gun in my life, never you know done anything like that, and then. Oh, there you are. Now you're in the jungle getting shot at by the Viet Cong, which is a very intelligent enemy, you know? So that's, that's tough. I'm, I'm just glad that they're starting to get some respect. Yeah, and I think that uh, in, in, in a lot of the, the older veterans, and, and my father and I had some conversations, of course, before he passed away about, about how um, uh, the, the support that we're getting wouldn't have been possible had it not been for their sacrifice and those years of suffering and silence. And, and, and a lot of them didn't. A lot of them started getting a lot of legislation and, and getting things passed to, to be able to help things out. And, and stand back to, to your point of, um, of, of we have the ability to, to get the word out. We have the ability to make a difference. Veterans of this era, 
Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, we are the largest cohort of combat veterans since World War II. With the sustained, uh, the, the sustained conflicts that we have, we're probably about a quarter of the greatest generation, but our voice can be amplified by, by what you guys did on the film, by what we're doing here. Um, we veterans of this generation, uh, you know, men, women, young, old, have the ability to be uh, the next greatest generation, this century's greatest generation. I think that you guys are doing a good job at, uh, at being a part of that. Well, we think you're doing a good job, too. <laughs> well, because I'm, a, yeah, I'm letting you be on my podcast. I don't know. It's just, it's just three guys talking to each other. But, but seriously, this is, I mean, you guys, uh, you know, I, um, in, in Stan, you, um, you shot me. Uh, it was one of those guys on LinkedIn. We connected, and, and uh, me and a couple of the other uh, hosts on the, the, the podcast network here, all of them watched the film, so they can't wait to, to hear you guys' story. Uh, and, and, and I've got, uh, you know, SF guys and, and Air Force guys and, and tankers that were in, uh, you know, uh, in the middle of Baghdad in, in Sadr City. And so you've got guys that are saying this is a, a, a damn good movie and, and needs to get out there. And so you guys are doing some great stuff. Well, we appreciate it. We, we wish those film festivals that turned it down would have heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. You know, we're all trying to, I mean, and it's about, and, and for me, guys, honestly, it's about getting below the noise. I give a crap about, you know, yeah. getting above the noise, but it's to the, the, the main point is for you guys to get the message to the men and women who, who need to hear it and, and who would be willing to listen. And, and in the, uh, at the end of the day, that's, that's the, uh, the key. That's the value of it. Yeah. And I think initially we thought we were making it just for our unit, but it's been, more or less like universal it seems like and it's a and it's a reception for most people like the 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 unit is specific as far as on film but the themes themselves are universal so it's i guess in that regard it definitely has helped quite a few people and we're thankful for any kind of impact that we've had and any kind of exposure that we've had for people to want to watch it and that's why we you know we put it for free online we don't we didn't try to make anything. We actually lost quite a bit of money making the film and it doesn't matter. Like it was a labor of love. And like, that's what we just, I, I enjoy doing. I love doing it. And that's kind of the only gifting I guess that we have that we can give back. So that's what we're going to do. But you can buy a copy if you want. <laughs> I was going to say there is a, you, you can, can watch it for free if you don't. Yeah. We don't really care. <laughs> so, uh, so, so tell me that, you know, let's, uh, let's give the audience, uh, a, a, where can they find the film? Where they, can they find you guys on social media if you got those open profiles? If they want to know more about what you guys are doing, uh, let us know. Yeah, uh, if you want to watch the film, it's at hammerdownfilm.com. Uh, if you want to see some of the uh, animal shenanigans that Daniel and I do, it's related, unrelated, but it's us. It's catchingcreation.com. And that's basically me on social media everywhere, whether it's Instagram or uh, Facebook. It's all at Catching Creation. Same thing on YouTube. Um, and then, you know. I'm like the old lady yeah. in that commercial that said, oh, I'm posting it to my wall. I'm and putting it's it up her. on my wall. Yeah, he said, uh, Stan <laughs> said you're a technical her. Luddite. That, uh, yeah, I am. You're, yeah, you're yeah. Like, uh, He's he has long suffering with me. But uh, I am on Facebook, so that's about it. I'm not... It's not a real big thing for me. <laughs> I'll be honest. Well, if nothing else, Daniel, it sounds like you are the uh, the the tempering calm to uh, to stand storm. So uh, weird way, yes. Well, I mean, it it sounds like one of you is brains and one of you is heart, and uh, and and you guys make a good team. Wait, that what does that make me? <laughs> oh, your heart. Oh, let me draw you. Sure. Not the heart, not the brains. <laughs> and you can eat the crayon after. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I really appreciate you guys coming on the show today, guys. Um, it's been really great. And hopefully um, you're, you're going to get your message out there and you're going to get more uh, veterans uh, doing the same kind of thing that you're doing. I, to be honest with you watching this, um, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I've got a uh, one of my former soldiers has some acreage out in Missouri uh, start ringing people up and see if, because we haven't done anything like this. And, uh, and, and so hopefully this is going to be an inspiration to, uh, to veterans and, and you guys continue doing your good work. We appreciate you letting us come on and talk about the film. Thank you again for your time. Yeah. And, it was, and mainly just reconnect with your battle buddies. Yeah. yeah. That's the big thing. So 
it is, folks. Episode 23 of the Headspace and Tommy podcast. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen. Um, you know, if you're curious uh, as to uh, what this is all about, uh, definitely uh, check out the, the Hammered Down documentary. Uh, we've got it connected on the show notes. You can find that at both changeyourpov.com slash HST23 uh, or veteranmentalhealth.com slash HST23. You know, uh, <clears throat> Stan and Daniel uh, really do a great job at, uh, at talking about uh, sort of some of the, the challenges and, and even the strengths that veterans have when they come back from combat. You know, the, uh, uh, they're the reality, they're the real deal. You know, the shenanigans of, uh, of even being in combat. And a lot of you who may not have served don't realize that uh, that's, that's a part of what we kind of went through. But there's some uh, uh, pretty funny stories and, and, and goofy stories to go along with the tragic stories. And I think both uh, Daniel and Stan really do a good job of um, showing that, uh, you know, just because you experience what you experience in combat doesn't mean it needs to be a lifelong uh, sentence. Uh, you, you don't have to wallow in the, uh, the, the drinking or the, the negative coping techniques. So uh, feel free to check out uh, Daniel and Stan and what they're doing. We'll make sure that uh, all the links to their stuff is in the show notes. And we look forward to talking to you next week. The struggle is real, found a piece and lost a soul Eventually my drinking, it got out of control There in darkness I roam, struggling to find home See suddenly death didn't feel so alone 22 a day, destination unknown It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones I've triumphed over enemies, co-created enemies Broke out facilities that tried to put an end to me R.I.P., I'd rather grind in tranquility Authentic tendency, embrace my ability so there you have it, folks. Another episode of Headspace and Timing, a show dedicated to changing your perspective on veteran mental health. I'd like to thank Doc Todd for giving us permission to use the track Not Alone from his amazing album, Combat Medicine. Doc's a guy who's trying to bring the discussions about veteran mental health out of the darkness and into the light, and you need to check him out. Head over to therealdoctod.com to purchase the album and support the cause. You're not alone, veterans. Ever. The struggle is real, found a piece and lost a soul Eventually my drinking, it got out of control There in darkness I roam, struggling to find home See suddenly death didn't feel so alone 22 a day, destination unknown It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones I've triumphed over enemies, co-created enemies Broke out facilities that tried to put an end to me R.I.P., I'd rather grind in tranquility Authentic tendency, embrace my ability from your forehead it's time man you've been through enough pain stand up it's time to stand back up all my veterans man army marine corps navy air force coast guard get up you know oh,